and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Well, Kobus, Obama is now safely back in Washington after a whirlwind tour of Kenya and Ethiopia this past week. Uh, he was the first American president to go to both countries, uh, and it sparked a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, you could feel the energy, particularly in Kenya, of the excitement of this Kenyan American president coming back to his, you know, his father's homeland. And in many ways, it was just such an incredibly exciting, feel-good experience. And it was exciting to see the president get engaged with Africa, particularly for those of us who are American and kind of have seen this administration neglect the African foreign policy for a very, very long time. Uh, and, and, and there's no way that the enthusiasm wasn't contagious. But at the same time, and what we're going to talk about today on the show is the contrast between the Americans and the Chinese approach and kind of take a look at the trip uh, and put it through a China-Africa filter. Um, and so, Kobus, first, let's, before we get started into the details, give me your assessment as you look back now on the four-day visit and all of the media coverage and the issues that were brought up and his address to the African Union. What's your headline from this tour? One of the headlines is that U.S. versus China and Africa seems to be a big thing now. You know, kind of the, the that has been the the kind of angle taken by a whole bunch of coverage um, in the run up to the visit and during the visit. So all of these these major media outlets were all contrasting U.S. China um, relations with Africa. So that, that was very interesting. Um, you know, kind of and how it's being kind of set up as this kind of rivalry, and frequently that you know a kind of a U.S. is losing out to China and Africa kind of narrative was very strong in international coverage, especially. Okay. Um, well, let's kind of, yeah. let's take it from there, because I think you bring up a very interesting point, because I saw a very big discrepancy between the international coverage that you're talking about, and you're absolutely right, there was very much this, you're going to Africa, Mr. Obama, but the Chinese are already there in a big way. Let's kind of, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the rhetoric that came out of the White House before the trip. And for an example, let me take you to uh, the Al Jazeera White House correspondent Patty Colhane's interview with United States Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker. And here the, the Commerce Secretary says she's really not bothered at all by the Chinese presence in Africa and China's engagement and China's kind of lead that they have in Africa. I want to talk to you about Africa. I know in the last couple of years, President Barack Obama has made it a huge emphasis, especially for your department. But at the same time, if you look at the numbers, China has been really getting a foothold there. How big is the advantage that China has? I don't worry about China's position in Africa. Really, what's more important is what we're trying to do is promote the opportunity for American business. So, Kobus, you point out that the media was framing the story in one way, but here is the Commerce Secretary framing it in an entirely different way. And this is the discrepancy that I saw coming out of the White House. But I mean, this has been the line that the Americans have been taking about China and Africa forever, right? I mean, they they always play it very cool. And they always, even when they, they they frequently don't really even acknowledge that there is a thing like China, Africa. And then when they do, they're like, well, that's not a problem anyway. We... Either the, either we both we, we do such different things in Africa that there is no competition, or that we do such different things in Africa so we can work together. You know, um, that has been generally the line I think that that has come out of Washington about this, with the occasional Hillary Clinton kind of fear mongering kind of thrown in. I can't figure out, and um, and I tweeted this the day the Pritzker interview came out. If the Americans are strategically promoting a line, as you say, to try and downplay the Chinese, to say, you know what, we're not bothered. Because you know what, as the sole superpower in the world, we don't get bothered by, you know, the B-League. Or is this consistent with what we see of the rhetoric on Capitol Hill, where we have seen the Senate Foreign Relations and the House Foreign Relations Committee spew the most stupid rhetoric that you can possibly imagine about the Chinese in Africa? And there is this sense in Washington that there, there is a cluelessness in Washington about the Chinese in Africa. They don't understand. First of all, Africa is not well understood in Washington. China is marginally better understood in Washington. And you put the two together and it's just this void. So when I heard Pritzker, I wasn't compelled to believe that she has any real understanding about the Chinese. And her dismissal of this, I don't worry about China's position in Africa, was more of a way for her to avoid the question because she doesn't know what to say. That, to me, was what I took away from this. Now, 
Oh, you know, Cobus, you posted up on our Facebook page a very interesting interview that the BBC did with President Obama before he left. This was done by North America editor John Sopel. And here you're going to hear what the president says about the Chinese in Africa. And again, you hear some of the themes that we heard in the Pritzker soundbite of really dismissing the Chinese as a threat or a challenge. But at the same time, he's, you know, giving the very big picture. Well, haven't the Chinese got there first in Africa? You're going to go to the African Union building, which was built with Chinese money. You're going to travel along Chinese built roads. You're going to go past endless Chinese traders on those roads. Well, what is true is that China has, uh, over the last several years, because of the surplus that they've uh, accumulated in global trade uh, and the fact that they're not accountable to uh, their uh, constituencies, have been able to funnel an awful lot of money into Africa, basically in exchange for uh, raw materials that are being extracted uh, from Africa. And uh, what is certainly true is that uh, the United States has to have a presence to promote the values that we care about. We welcome Chinese aid into Africa. I think we think that's a good thing. We don't want to discourage it. As I've said before, what I also want to make sure, though, is, is that that trade is benefiting the ordinary Kenyan and the ordinary Ethiopian and the ordinary Ghanaian, uh, and not just a few elites and the Chinese who then uh, get the resources uh, that they need. And uh, I think that we can help to shape an agenda where China, Europe, and the United States are all working together uh, in order to uh, address some of these issues. It's very interesting for me that he focused on aid, that he called it Chinese aid, um, because, you know, I think everyone agrees that Chinese aid is actually a relatively small part of, of China-Africa engagement, and Chinese trade and investment is actually much bigger. Um, so I was wondering if, if, if couching it in this way, actually is a way of, of avoiding what what um, the F Forbes contributor Laura Led called in essentially saying that that Obama's big on inspiration and short on cash right that there's a, that there's a kind of a way of avoiding the the very obvious question so why exactly is China <laughs> investing so much money in you know kind of in Africa where where you know kind of and, and clearly making a lot of money out of that as well while the US isn't and I mean one question is maybe that the US just because of the moment where they are in terms of of, you know, kind of international engagement and war and the, you know, kind of economic issues and so on just doesn't have that much free cash lying around, maybe? Yeah, but, okay, and I'm going to sound very skeptical here, but there's another way of thinking about this, which is that as much as the Americans talk about how they're redefining Africa to be more about trade and less about aid, the fact remains that in the United States, most American politicians, and I would say the vast majority of Americans in the public eye, kind of still look at Africa as a basket case. And the words aid and Africa instinctively go together. Um, and again, you know, so, so him talking about the Chinese and aid and Africa might be the vocabulary that the Americans have when it comes to Africa still, despite the fact that they have changed their public rhetoric. But it's just, to me... I, I get so frustrated when I hear Obama talk about the, the Chinese this way, in part because it is this vast oversimplification of it all. Now, again, this might be part of their communication strategy to not kind of play up the Chinese. Cool. I get that. But the way that he was kind of framing things to say that he doesn't want trade to benefit the ordinary, you know, he wants trade to benefit the ordinary Kenyan and the ordinary Ethiopian. You know, I keep thinking to myself about Nigeria, and all the years that America imported oil from Nigeria. And did the average Nigerian benefit from it? And it just strikes me as this glaring hypocrisy on the part of the Americans to talk about the Chinese in this way, when in fact it's been American business and European business that have behaved like this in Africa for centuries. Yeah, and I mean, to take that further, you know what benefits Nigerians? Cheap cell phones. You know who doesn't make cheap cell phones? The U.S., you know, so it's like the, you know, the fact that China makes these kind of cheap electronics, especially communication electronics, and then also set up the, the 4G networks to run them on, that fundamentally changes life in Africa. You know, so, and I mean, that's the U.S. Has, is not engaged with that at all. So I don't want this show. And again, I get a lot of criticism 
that I am too anti-American and I'm too pro-Chinese, um, which is not true. Um, I actually deeply love my country. Um, yeah, I am you're, who, you're pretty much, you're also anti-everyone. <laughs> well, I'm anti-everyone, but I get most criticism that I'm anti-American and I'm pro-Chinese, which is ridiculous. Um, so I don't want people to kind of walk away from the comments that we're pointing out to think that I am anti-American, I, and I'm not. And, I, and I'm very proud that it's my country and my head of state that goes to a country like Kenya and Ethiopia and is able to generate the amount of hope and enthusiasm that people really put on America's shoulders. You know, I live in a country um, that's not free. I live here in Vietnam. And when I talk to people about the United States, they want so badly for America to be everything it can be. Because things here are completely messed up. Nothing works. There's corruption. The infrastructure isn't strong. It's comparable to any middle-income country in Africa. And people look to the United States as a place that is different and is hopeful. And I, and I really respect that. The problem I have in this is that I obsess over U.S. news. I come from this country and this culture, and I see a lot more of the warts than a lot of people who live outside of the country do. And so when I see, you know, Obama going to Ethiopia and Kenya and, you know, the U.S. Embassy here in Hanoi talking about democracy, it's very hard for me to separate that rhetoric from the considerable and very serious human rights problems that exist in the United States. Um, you know, just this week, there's a man by the name of Sam DuBose. And if you're not familiar with that name, Sam DuBose, you will be familiar with it because he is the new... Sandra Bland, he is the new Trayvon Martin, he is the new Eric Garner. It seems like almost every week goes by that, you know, a law enforcement officer in the United States is shooting a minority or an African American. We have a health care crisis. We have 30 million people who don't have enough food. And so when we hear Obama's lofty rhetoric, it is difficult for me to separate those two, the reality from the, the propaganda. So that's where, that's the difficult struggle that I face. And this kind of came up Again, where we're not sure if Obama is just dumb, poorly informed, <laughs> or not getting it. So on, when he went to Ethiopia, he called the government there democratically elected. Now, this is a government that won 100% of the vote. You know, the, the, the Central American and South American dictators had the decency at least to leave like 2 or 3% to an opposition, a fig leaf. Ethiopia has gone backwards in its democracy. And, and this is not the first time that American officials have said this. And back in April, on April 16th, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, she praised Ethiopia as a democracy. Now, Kobus, what is going on here? This is what I don't understand. How is it possible that he can go to a country and that is, you know, as repressive as the Ethiopian government is and say this? Let's take a listen to the soundbite at a press conference on the last day that Obama was in Addis Ababa, where he praised the democratically elected government. Now, we are very mindful of Ethiopia's history. Uh, the hardships that this country has gone through, uh, it has been relatively recently in which the constitution that was formed and the elections uh, put forward a, a democratically elected government. Look, there's no way that Obama does, isn't aware of, of human rights abuses in Ethiopia. I mean, there's just no way. So I, I would say what's talking here is the fact that America has, has very significant uh, security interests in Ethiopia, that they run a drone base there, that that Ethiopia is central to, to um, you know, kind of North African and Middle East secu security concerns that, that worry the, the Americans a whole lot. And this is the price Obama's paying. You know, kind of, I think it's, I think it's real politic. Uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any real other way of reading it. Um, you know, kind of, it's, what's interesting for me, though, is that Ethiopia is extremely repressive. Ethiopia is also, thanks to Chinese investment, actually economically growing, and not only growing because it's selling raw minerals, but growing through actual manufacturing. Um, so it is this very interesting situation where, as Obama calls Ethiopia a democracy, what Ethiopia, the real, the reality in Ethiopia actually proves is that maybe, you know, kind of economic growth in Africa needs to take place 
apart from democracy that you know kind of all of these all of these actual democratic countries in africa can't get ahead and the one that can get ahead is the one with no democracy and then you know kind of and then they will end up being praised as a democracy by the us okay so that's an interesting take on it you know i was on uh, huffington post live uh, video this this week to talk about uh, the visit and one of the the kind of the ideas that i put forth is that maybe the americans are talking kind of in a projection type of way they you know, Ethiopia today isn't a democracy, but, you know, with enough pressure, they can be kind of lured that way. And I bring up this idea, and I've talked about this before on the show, that there is this war of ideas that's out there. And in some ways, Ethiopia is the front line. This war of ideas is between the American kind of view of democracy, of liberal economy, liberal small L, uh, liberal markets, open markets, free trade, uh, you know, Jeffersonian type democracy. And that's what the United States really promotes all over the world. And we heard that a lot in Kenya and Ethiopia. Then there's the state authoritarian capitalism model that uh, the Chinese are very aggressive in, in showcasing. Uh, Kobus, you've talked about this in some of your research, that that is a form of soft power in itself, that people may not like China for its lack of democracy and human rights policy, but boy, they do like what they see coming out of the economic side. And then I the think third. I would actually even I, I would put that even in a in a bleaker way in the sense that I think in, in lots of especially in government circles in Africa they love the combination of the two they love the 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 fact that development managed to grow out of a lack of liberal democracy that's the thing that they like um, I think that's that's increasingly true in a bunch of different countries um, and that's a kind of a weird perverted kind of anti democratic soft power that I think is coming out of of china africa relations that's that's very interesting but yeah and I, okay so to that point then to pick up on what you're saying there in Ethiopia in so many ways seems to be paralleling more the China model of kind of state driven capitalism uh, and kind of state control authoritarianism, you know, dread, trying to drive economic growth. But the third kind of idea, ideology war, is kind of religious fundamentalism. And that's what we see in northern in Nigeria with Boko Haram. We see it in Mali, in Libya with the rise of ISIS. And, and, and there's are these three competing ideas and ideologies that are kind of crashing in together. The problem with the Americans is I don't think that we understand that this is a fight. We still think that everybody ultimately wants to be democratic. And it's, it's really a shortcoming in the American worldview that, you know, in many parts of the developing world that I've lived in, in the country that I live in today in Vietnam, I manage about 100 people. I've asked many of the young people, do you want to be a democracy? And they go, eh, not so much. And they're not afraid of censorship or the government. What they want more than anything is a functioning society. They want less corruption. They want street lights that work. They want, you know, sewages that work. They want to have, you know, uninterrupted electricity. They want corruption eliminated from the police department. Day-to-day -day life to become easier long before they want democracy. And I hear that a lot in Africa as well. And but yet, yeah, I hear, I hear that in South Africa. And I mean, South Africa is... is presumably uh, in, a know, democracy. Kind of in, in, yeah, no, I mean, it's South Africa, I think, is this interesting case where it's essentially sitting on this kind of knife's edge between these two different systems. Um, and you have a situation where the, the state is becoming more and more dysfunctional, you know, kind of there's this problems similar to Vietnam, I think, you know, kind of problems of rolling blackouts, all of these kind of things. And I can see with people I know that if, if there was some kind of magical deal where you would give up like 25% of your democratic rights in, you know, and, and what you gain is electricity that never goes out, some people would go with that. Um, I think know, a lot and, of people would go I think that that's, a, that's a, a developing world reality. Okay, so, you know, speaking of developing world realities, and this is where the burden of Obama in Africa compared to the Chinese comes down. You know, the U.S. administration goes to a place like Kenya and Ethiopia, and this was the, the case when he was in Tanzania and elsewhere, and, and, and I would say it even extends to other developing countries as well. And they bring this enormous agenda with them. They're talking about aid. They're talking about development, capacity building, religious freedom. They're talking about political freedom, democracy, dissidents. I'm just trying to think of the list just on this trip alone of all the things they addressed. And then let's take, for example, gay rights. 
This is this was an issue that came up, and it was a point of real contention between President Obama and President Kenyatta in Nairobi. And it highlights, I think, the difficulty that the Americans have carrying the burden of all of these kind of freedom and democracy issues on their shoulder that their main geopolitical competitors don't have to carry. When Xi Jinping goes to Africa, when he was in Tanzania, or Li Keqiang goes to Kenya, they focus on one thing and one thing only. They're not talking about gay rights. They're not talking about religious freedom. They're talking about trade and economic development. End of story. But here, let's take a listen. And first we'll hear from President Obama, then we'll hear from President Kenyatta. And when you listen to this, listen to the frustration and the annoyance in President Kenyatta's voice when they bring up the issue of gay rights in Kenya. If you look at the history of countries around the world, when you start treating people differently, not because of any harm they're doing anybody, but because they're different, that's the path whereby freedoms begin to erode. As uh, an African-American in the United States, uh, I am painfully aware of the history of what happens when people are treated differently under the law. And there were all sorts of rationalizations that were provided by the power structure for decades in the United States for segregation and Jim Crow and slavery, and they were wrong. It's very difficult for us to be able to impose on people that which they themselves do not accept. This is why I repeatedly say that for Kenyans today, the issue of gay rights is really a non-issue. We want to focus on other areas that are day-to-day -day living for our people. Maybe once, like you have, overcome some of these challenges, we can begin to look at new ones, but as of now, the fact remains that this issue is not really an issue that is on the foremost mind of Kenyans, and that is the fact. Kobus, this is a particularly sensitive issue for you as well, you know, and, and I'd be interested to hear your take on this in the context of the burden that Americans have feeling the need to raise these issues in comparison to the Chinese who don't have any obligation because in so many ways... This really identifies what the non-interference in other countries' internal affairs, which is the ultimate bedrock of Chinese foreign policy, this is the kind of thing they want to avoid. Yes, I mean, and I think, you know, kind of the Chinese have made a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of headway in Africa because they don't address these issues at all. Um, you know, and, and obviously it's it's fundamental to, to Chinese foreign policy. They don't want to have their internal affairs kind of discussed outside of China and they don't do it to other people. I think what's interesting, though, is that it's in a way kind of inimical to what China, I think, plans for itself in the long term, which is, you know, to, to really be a, a global power. Um, you know, if you're a global power, then to a large extent, you you shape how people live around the world. So you have to bring a, a whole set of coherent ideas of what life should be like. Um, you know, the, the, U, the US has done that. You know, colonial powers in, in, in Europe has done that frequently disastrously. Um, and the Soviet Union did that to a large extent. So, you know, kind of it's interesting, the fact that China doesn't touch on these issues to a certain extent keeps it small for the moment. You know, kind of it keeps it uh, still a, a developing power, which it is, you know... If, in fairness, it also calls itself. Um, so, so that's that's interesting. You know, kind of. Um, on the other hand, yeah, as, as you mentioned, for me, this is a, this is a, you know kind of close to home. Um, you know, kind of. I'm gay myself. I'm in a, you know kind of my my partner and I. You know, uh, you know, have been together for a long time, and so for me, I, for example, this kind of pains me. This issue pains me, and but it's also an interesting one in the sense that. The U.S. to a large extent, not not the U.S. government, but U.S. society, has to a large extent shaped what gay being gay means, and it shaped it in a very positive way. Um, you know, especially because you know because of of decades and decades of activism, the U.S. has essentially you know kind of created what we mean by being gay. So in that sense, Obama, you know, kind of Obama also pushing it from an from an official um, position. 
made me glad and it made me happy and it made me feel, you know, just as, a, as an individual, feel clo much closer to the U.S. And it also paradoxically made me feel much more alienated from Kenya, of course, um, because, you know, kind of I felt that what... Um, what Kenyatta, the point that Kenyatta was making was essentially a false one in the sense that, uh, you know, he was pretending that there's no way of doing both, you know, kind of human rights improvement and development at the same time, um, as if you first have to do the one or the, the other. And now I know that I'm, I'm sounding essentially like, you know, kind of like a U.S. government <laughs> spokesperson. Well, you, but, you know, kind of, but yeah, you know, go you, ahead. You're highlighting in many ways Kenyatta is echoing the Chinese because the Chinese say that as a developing country, they have to focus first on social and economic rights to put, you know, food in people's bellies, a roof over their head, a shirt on their back. And then once we've done that, we can start worrying about civil and political rights. And to your point, you're saying that they can both be done. I guess what, what I find surprising is, and, and, and is that I understand why African leaders are so happy and relieved to, to, to welcome a Chinese delegation to their country because they know they're not going to be lectured on this, on any of this stuff. And that it is, must be very liberating to not have the Europeans and the Americans kind of talking down to them. Let us not forget that it was only until a month ago that it was illegal in the United States for gay people to marry. A month ago. Yeah, and I mean, you know, kind of, and, 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 and President oh, Obama himself, you know, kind of only came around to the idea of gay marriage. He evolved. Essentially two minutes ago. He evolved. He evolved yeah. and, and what I guess I, what I don't understand is that when I saw the reaction in uh, in the African Union, and I see the comments and the reaction uh, to these to, to to the gay rights issue. I, I just I shake my head because the United States is not progressive on these types of issues, and I, I just you know. And he talks about corruption in politics, and yet the United States has the Citizens United decision from the the Supreme Court, which Obama himself was elected with a billion dollars. It took a billion dollars to get Obama elected in 2012. And so the Americans kind of go and talk about, you know, eliminating money and corruption from politics. We talk about gay rights and we ourselves aren't immune from that. And that's where I don't understand why people don't also see that. Yeah, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, kind of one of the amazing things about the U.S. is how it keeps thinking of itself as this kind of, it's, it's, it keeps us thinking of itself as an example for the world, even if it is failing itself at the same time. So it's kind of essentially both the train and the person running after the train. Um, you know, kind of so it, it, you know, kind of by projecting itself as this kind of paragon of, of virtue in a way, it is also then actually enacting, you know, kind of actual virtue. Frequently, you know, so I mean, it is a country that, that in astonishing speed managed to actually convince its own people that gay marriage is a good idea, you know, and, and they didn't manage to actually change the law. You know, kind of, and in that sense, it then then becomes this kind of locomotive of of social development that pulls along a whole bunch of other countries in its wake. Um, you know, so I mean, you have to give them that. I guess I, you know, you're absolutely right, and we are a very adaptable country, and I think much more adaptable than many other countries. Uh, we are adaptable in terms of our ability to assimilate more immigrants than the rest of the world combined. Uh, we are, are much more adaptable on ideas, as we've talked about with, with gay rights. And so in that sense, um, that's again why I go back to the top of the show, I'm very, very proud to be an American. So while my, I'm just trying to head off some of the, the, the tweet hate I'm going to get <laughs> and the emails that I get and the Facebook post that we get that says, you know, I'm an asshole because I hate America and I love China. No, I mean, China certainly can't do any of this stuff that the Americans are doing and uh, that we've talked on social policy uh, and, and their role in the world. People don't look to China the same way as they look to America. But I just, I just, I, I feel like in many ways that the United States is running on fumes with what you've talked about. That you know, people I see here, people in Vietnam, they're they're watching the news. They see Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. They see what's happening in Ferguson. They see all of this stuff. It's not subtle in any way. And at what point are people going to wake up and say that the United States, you know, is not as exceptional as it thinks it is? Is not the house on the hill as much as the world needs America to be the house on the hill? Because the rest of the world, in many parts, is miserable. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think what what will end up deciding a lot of that is what China does in the future, you know, um, to which extent China is able to project some form of of ideal, um, because at the moment it can't really. You're not going to have anyone who, who who just takes a cursory look at China. I mean, you have to admire its incredible growth. I mean, you're not going to have an, its its amazing development, and it, that is admired in Africa. But so frequently, you're not going to have when. And, and I mean, I I teach courses on soft power and public diplomacy every you're not going to have every few months, and you're not going to have. I always ask start off by asking students so. You know, what do you think of China? And they're all like, "Wow, China is amazing." It, you know, it's developing so quickly and so on. And then, do you want to live in China? No, not no. at all. <laughs> you and know, because human rights, because no Google, because pollution, etc. Right. So, I mean, if China can't project itself in that kind of way, then you know, then we end up being so stuck with the city on the hill, even if, if you know, kind of, even if it doesn't kind and, of completely and that make China, it. China, in some ways, might be America's ultimate savior in this sense. That because China will never be able to offer an alternative to the United States. China, you know, Xi Jinping is promoting the China dream. But as you pointed out, under Xi Jinping, uh, state repression has has intensified. Um, You know, the gap between rich and poor has intensified. Um, You know, he's mounted an anti-corruption campaign, but that seems very selective in many respects to go after people that he doesn't like. It's not necessarily affecting corruption at the base level. Um, I myself will not move back to China. I lived in China for almost 10 years, and I will not move back to China because of the pollution and the Internet and, and the quality of life. And, and again, I am, I'm not an immigrant. I would never aspire, and I can never imagine other people aspiring to live in China. And, and a lot of people don't. They go there for an economic opportunity, and many Africans are in Guangzhou for that reason. But that's not necessarily anything aspirational. Yeah, but you know, you know what's also, you know, kind of what, what I find, what I found kind of frustrating about about this kind of debate, the China versus U.S. in Africa debate that, that took place around Obama's visit, was that it still is again leaving Africa in this uh, this kind of like Africa-shaped gap, you know, there's so little like real hard-nosed looking at what Africa is really like and kind of why, you know, kind of in there's so little criticism of Africa, actually. It's, it's such a weird thing to say because Africa is frequently seen as a basket case. But like, I kept thinking, why isn't Uhuru Kenyatta like just slammed more about this, this gay rights issue? For example, because... You know, you said you don't want to move back to China. You know where I won't move is Kenya. Even though Kenya is, you know, kind of in a lot of ways in, in a, you know, economically very, very promising. And it looks like an amazing place to live in lots of ways. And, you know, kind of for, for someone who is interested in, interested in positioning himself in, you know, kind of in African media centers and academic centers and so on, Nairobi is a great place to be, um, you know, kind of especially because it's essentially the new hub of East Africa. But I don't want to live there because they hate me and they, you know, I can never take my partner there. And I, you know, kind of my, you know, I, I'll be unsafe on a daily basis. You know, kind of, and that is has an economic impact on Kenya, and it it keeps Kenya back as a center of you know of of the new global south. But no one ever says that, and no one says, you know what, you kind of suck because you you have these kind of backward laws. Like that's somehow not you know. I I find it so frustrating yeah. that Africa is isn't really kind of taken to task about these things. Well, it's consistent with a lot of the coverage that we saw after. So if the coverage in before the Obama trip was, you know, America catching up to China and Africa, a lot of it afterwards I saw was like that Forbes article you talked about, which is America and China competing for Africa. And it strips Africa of any agency. Africa is this prize to be won by the Chinese and the Americans. Which suitor will get her hand? And I just, Mm. to me, again, and you've talked about this too for a long time, which is this lack of agency that Africa has in, in in the eyes of the international press. And I think in the eyes of a lot of people outside of Africa, and maybe Africans themselves, that they don't expect much. There's an insecurity that's there. But what, what I found also in the Chinese coverage, there wasn't much Chinese coverage um, at all, which was surprising. Um, they did the kind of pro forma, Obama's in Kenya, Obama's in Ethiopia. But 
towards the end, you started to see the insecurities come out. And in the Global Times is usually the attack dog of the Chinese press. They'll say things that CCTV, uh, Xinhua, and some of the others won't say. The Global Times is a more nationalistic, fiery newspaper. And, and it really reveals how pathetic the Chinese government is when it comes to communicating these things. There was no reason. It was reason. so clunky. It they, was they, just they, their coverage was so clunky. It's it pathetic. Really it's, it's just pathetic. And, and the way that they rain down, I mean, it just, it really reveals this deep insecurity that the Chinese have about the Americans and their role in the world. And it shows that there's still as a government, because all of this, when we look at the media, it's not like in other countries where the media writes one thing and the government is a separate entity. The media is an extension of the party. And so the media is speaking and none of this goes without a lot of vetting. And so when they're publishing these racist cartoons about Obama having his homecoming to Kenya with the inflated lips, and when they're publishing these editorials on the front page of the Global Times, kind of, you know, criticizing the Americans for bashing the Chinese, it just shows you how far the Chinese have to go to really becoming a mature member of, you know, the great power club. And I just, I, I just you know, if you're going to, you know, either shut up and let it kind of happen, as you did for most of the trip, Beijing, or kind of put something intelligent that's out there instead of this kind of knee-jerk North Korean style kind of denunciations, which I thought was just, you know, it was just, it was annoying to read. Yeah, it was very primitive. And, you know, kind of, and I mean, there are so many holes to pick in the Obama, I mean, you know, kind yeah, of to, to Africa. It's just like what we've done for the past 45 so minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, exactly. But like then accusing him of playing, quote, the family card. I mean, it's, it's just, just really again, it's pathetic. So, um, you know, OK, so I think we've kind of laid it all out. I, I, I'm wondering what kind of reaction we're going to get to today's show. So we would love to hear from you. I mean, this is the kind of show where we kind of both Kobus and I revealed a little bit more of ourselves. Typically, we, we try to take a little bit more of a journalistic kind of, you know, third party sense to it. This was a very, you know, personal visit for both of us, uh, for me being American, on, you know, for Cobus on the issue of gay rights. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of, you know, peel back the onion a little bit. Uh, but, you know, this debate is, is not you know, complete without your contribution. So on Facebook, uh, this is a, an excellent kind of place to pick up our discussion, facebook.com slash China Africa Project. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at eolander, E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Um, I really relish uh, the discussions. Uh, pro, con, you know, I just, the only thing I don't like is when it becomes personal. So I don't respond to anything that is a uh, uh, you know, a hostile attack of any kind, um, and you know that's what that's our kind of our rules, Cobus on Facebook. If you if you drop the f bomb or if you start attacking somebody in a kind of bizarrely immature way, we delete that and don't respond to that. But pretty much everything else we do, and we love it when people disagree with us uh, because it's really all about generating a discussion. So, Cobus, if people want to disagree with you, what's the best way for them to do it? You can find me on, uh, on Twitter at Stadenesque. That's S-T-A-D-E-N-E-S-Q-U-E. And again, that's Facebook.com slash China Africa Project. Uh, Cobus and I are updating that page, believe it or not, 24 hours a day. Cobus over there in South Africa. I'm over here in Vietnam and Asia. So we've got it covered. It's just a great way to kind of follow the latest news. So go ahead and follow that. And you can now on Facebook... You know, there's a feature that you can click. Uh, I forgot the name of it. It's like see it first or news first. And it will make sure it comes in the top of your feed uh, more regularly and not get buried. And so we recommend you do that. If you want to follow a slightly less intense kind of uh, curated news feed, follow me on Twitter at eolander, E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. And finally, if all of that is just too much and you're just listening to this podcast once, uh, but you do want to follow a little bit of China Africa news, Copus and I, we publish a, a newsletter every Monday that goes out. Uh, go to our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com and you can sign up right there. And we put out four or five stories just for a week. So the top four or five stories that we think are important on China-Africa relations. We also throw in uh, a long read at the bottom of it. So if you want on your weekend to print out something interesting to kind of do a deep dive on, uh, that's there as well. So uh, we do email, Twitter, Facebook, and of course this podcast if you want to follow the podcast. iTunes is the best way, China, Africa. Just put it in the search box and we'll show on up there. So we'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening.